Yes. So hello everyone and welcome to the first one B Mind seminar for this semester. Uh, my name is Axel Flint and it's, it is my pleasure to introduce Christian Bredies from Universität Graz uh, to give the first talk. Um, he obtained his PhD from the University of Bremen, I think in 2008. And he has published a lot of interesting research articles in themes including functional analysis, uh, signal processing, and optimization. Today, he will give a talk on dynamic optimal transport for sparse dynamic super resolution and beyond. The floor is yours, Christian. Yeah, so thank you, Axel. Thank you for the introduction, also for the invitation. I'm very happy to yeah, speak within this uh, seminar. Yeah, as uh, Axel already announced so the talk will be about dynamic optimal transport sparse dynamic super resolution and beyond and i'm going to explain what this beyond uh, is uh, during uh, the talk of course huh? so this is joint work with marcello carioni silvio fanzon and also francisco romero okay so let's look at the motivation so how, why were we looking into dynamic inverse problems and dynamic optimal transport so um so in tomography, in particular MRI, so there is um, it's always a problem that you that you have motion. So and so motion is a problem because it happens faster than the acquisition. So you have subacquisition time scales, and if you just reconstruct as you do it normally, so you would get artifacts. And in MRI, this is um, uh, relevant, for instance, in imaging of the lung or the heart, where motion cannot be suppressed, and also for higher resolution imaging. And you just here, like, like an example. So what you see here is an MRI reconstruction of the beating heart. And uh, so the left hand side, you can see reference data, which is called, which is obtained called, with a technique called gating. So you have, um, let's say, several heartbeats where you can reconstruct. And on the right hand side, you can actually see like the reconstruction from the amount of data you are able to obtain in one beat of the heart cycle. So if you really want to capture dynamics, so this is like the resolution that you get. And of course, you want to increase them somehow by yeah, by the higher information, regularization, and so on. And, and this is um, uh, the idea. So increase resolution via optimal transport regularization, for instance. So this is this is one thing, a connotation for MRI. Um, so how is this connected with sparse super resolution? So there is a, a super resolution is, can be seen as like, like a static problem, for instance. So you wish to solve uh, like an inversion problem for the Fourier transform, very simplified on a finite set. So, you, so fu is equal to f on a finite set. And you make a sparsity assumption, which means that the signal that you are trying to recover is uh, composed of finally many delta peaks. And um, so the one thing that one can do is um, radar norm regularization, which means that, for instance, one minimizes the radar norm subject to the linear constraint given by the Fourier uh, measurements, or you do like a relaxed, regularized version with a noisy data where you have an L2 type discrepancy and a radar norm. And this actually allows you also to recover, let's say, sparse solution. And there's a lot of literature on this, very much more. So, and I cannot, um, of course, go through all. So, just having one, but um, th there's a really a huge topic here. Okay, so, but in this talk, we would like to study a dynamic version of this approach. And this is also like a motivation to do it. Um, yeah, here's an outline. So, I will just, um, let's say, talk a little bit about peak recoveries for static inverse problems, so which covers also super resolution, then go to the dynamic setting, like the dynamic optimal transport formulation, and then discuss an uh, algorithm that is, um, that is capable of um, yeah, computing solutions. Okay, so yeah, let's start with the static setting. And of course, I mean, this problem that we just saw, like the super resolution problem in a static uh, formulation, is um, if you do the t of regularization approach, like a special case of uh, uh, solving inverse problems. And there's nothing that uh, just prevents us just to look at this from the inverse problem uh, perspective. And this is how it looks like, right? if you do it from the inverse problem point of view. Um, so you want to minimize, like for instance, uh, like a forward operator uh, with data in a Hilbert space, and then you just take the radar norm as a regularizer. Okay, so and here what you can do is you can just take your data in the Hilbert space, so then 
you just in your measures like where you want to have um, let's say delta peaks is uh, living on a separate compact space such that you have the duality between continuous function with um, like say which vanish on the boundary and uh, uh, the space of signed rather measures and also you can just um, formulate the forward operator in terms of an adjoint which gives you weak star continuity and this is already good from the functional analytic perspective because then you can prove uh, existence of a minimizer and um, and uh, many other things right so now how uh, is it possible to let's say obtain sparse solution in a certain uh, sense and um, so that should give you an intuition why you can actually get delta peak solution um, one can can switch to a dual formulation or pre-dual formulation of the problem so here is like the Tikhonov minimization problem and this is like a pre-dual version and you see the structure here is a little bit different so you are minimizing um, yeah, the, the quadratic uh, distance um, uh, to the data here, uh, subject to these constraints, so it's a projection problem that you have, and so operator A enters in the set you project onto. And um, well, so if you have a, like a primal dual problem pair, so you can just also formulate optimality conditions in an optimality system, and in, in this case it looks as follows, right? So you have a dual variable that is infinity bounded by alpha, alpha is a regularization parameter, and, and then you know that where this constraint, infinity constraint is active. So this is a superset of where your measure is supported. And then you know uh, also the sign in the case of, um, let's say, signed measures uh, of uh, your solution, um, depending on which of the two constraints is active. And ju just to give you, let's say, like an illustration, for instance, so th this is like a primal dual optimal pair, right? So the primal solution is consisting of delta peaks. And now if you compute like this A, A star, U star minus F delta, the dual variable. Uh, so, so you can see that this obeys infinity bounds and it just touches minus alpha in exactly those four points. And, um, and of course it has to touch on minus alpha because here the solution is positive. So this fits together. And uh, in particular means that sparse solutions are possible. So we are going a little more into detail why um, this is actually also possible in many other situations, but this is just an example. Okay, and then if you consider this from the inverse problem perspective, and of course, you wish to know what happens if the, you know, your noise goes to zero because we're doing Tikhonov regularization. And uh, for instance, like if your noise level goes to zero for varying data and you do, let's say, a reasonable parameter choice, you get weak star subsequent um, um, convergence into a minimum norm solution. So, um, so this is somehow meaning that you actually have a regularizing property. And you can also get rates um, in terms of the Bregman distance uh, of the Rada norm, which is cut somehow weak, but of course you can also uh, improve on this and you get also better, let's say, approximation properties. But in particular, so like the minimum that one can expect is like weak star convergence and convergence in the Bregman um, distance. And if you're just a little bit better, you can get more results, of course. Okay, and of course, like one example would be a sparse um, super resolution, like for recovery from finitely many Fourier measurements. But what also is nice about the setting that you can also do sparse deconvolution. So um, solving this kind of convolution problem with rather than regularization. Um, of course, this works. So the framework that we have from the functionalistic view uh, fits here. And um, you can just apply it um, in a straightforward way and it just gives you, let's say, this application. Okay, so now let's um, discuss a little bit um, how you can solve these kind of problems numerically. And of course, you can discretize, um, but there's also like another um, possibility that you can just um, do. You, you don't actually don't need to discretize the space of. Um, rather than measures. Huh? So this is leading to, let's say, conditional gradient, Frank, Torf, Frank Wolf type methods. So here we're assuming that we are just the iterates of finitely many data peaks. And then what you do is, okay, well, so just initialize somewhere. The main step is computation of like this dual variable. And this is like a function in space. And what you can then do is you just take the absolute value and just find the maximum of the absolute value of this function. So like this is, uh, this is then a, 
like a point could be non-unique but whatever yeah so you just choose one and then you just um, place a delta peak here um, and um, this is a candidate um, yeah let's say for we have a, like a descent direction you can say and then um, so what you do is you just uh, you just build a convex combination between your finite many peak solution and this new peak here um, so you have you can realize several step size rules um, like I don't know, optimal line search but also something else and then okay you just also perform a thresholding step on the coefficients so which just um, means that some of these uh, coefficients could be set to zero and it's still um, decreasing like the function of value that you actually want to minimize okay and this is like a successive peak insertion and thresholding algorithm and the nice thing about this is as i just mentioned so it's a, like corresponding to a generalization of the conditional gradient method so what you have to do is with the rather norm so you have to ensure that it somehow grows um, uh, faster than linear uh, such that you can solve the soft problems but then uh, you can just uh, identify this as a yeah like conditional gradient method and you get like one over n convergence in terms of the iterates and the functional value and also subsequently weak star convergence and the soft thresholding step so this is something that um, eliminates superfluous peaks um, because just if you add in each step one more peak so then it might be computation um, infeasible so you just can limit the number of peaks if everything goes well with the soft thresholding set you just throw the, the ones with the coefficient zero away and um, so this uh, this combined method actually converges so it's not so much hard to say and here's just an example um, again yeah well so like the 1d deconvolution example with a, like a, a cubic p spline again like the radon space is not discretized so you just want to recover the solution um, you can also incorporate let's say some additional tweaks here but in the end if you want to recover let's say um, yeah this uh, from this data where the red one is the exact data and the blue one is the noisy data and you run this algorithm you can actually recover uh, the peaks quite well so the peak positions are pre pretty close but of course you also have the bias towards zero which is coming from the rather norm uh, regularization which is some kind of generalization of l1 type okay so in the static case this is uh, working so these these uh, algorithms are like of frank wolf type they also be well studied so on and tweaked a lot also you can just slide the steps and so on um okay so now let's move to the dynamic setting and um so what we want to do is we want to use dynamic optimal transport for that so and of course dynamic optimal transport is something that is um is, is not clear because from the beginning because this optimal transfer problems are usually set in this so formulated in a static setting so the class very classical formulation or one of these is just uh, you have two probability measures and you want to find transport maps map that is transporting one probability measure into the other by the push forward right so moving mass uh, along uh, this transport map so this is the usual picture that can draw so the probability distribution just just reparameter space such that it maps um, like another one and now the goal is of course to move yeah to do this um, transport in an optimal way and the model here is that uh, you have a cost of moving mass from one point to another so like this point quite squared for the cost so this is what we uh, will consider in the following and then the total cost is just okay well this, yeah well this distance here and of course you have to weight it with the probability measure here and uh, integrated, of course. And uh, if you want to find the best transport map, so then you try to solve the, the minimization problem of all these measurable um, uh, transport maps uh, subject to the push forward constraint, which minimizes this energy. Now, dynamic optimal transport is a little bit different. Here, the idea is instead of having, let's say, two probability distributions, um, so you just actually consider a curve of um, uh, probability distribution. So you could call it here rho t. So each of yeah, for each t you have such a probability distribution, and then you just uh, subject them to the continuity equation. And, and so the continuity equation just tells you, okay, well you have a velocity field which is not clear at the moment, 
um, but it looks like this. And then just uh, so the velocity field is just, um, uh, let's say, advecting this mass here. And, and, and this is what how you can formulate uh, that. And of course, what you also want to have is like the, the initial data is, is, a, is, a, is this curve at zero, and the final data is this curve at one. So the, the picture here is, okay, well, you start with the initial distribution, so then you just choose some vector field uh, V here, so which gives you some intermediate um, um, yeah, probability distribution in the end you are here. So this is um, how you model it. Another main point of dynamical optimal transport, this is like an observation by Bill Moon Bernier, uh, is that if you minimize like this energy here, which is basically yeah, the, the, the Euclidean norm squared of the velocity, of course, weighted with, um, yeah, with the probability measure here over space time. And of course, they have to solve the continuity equation and initial final constraints here. So then this minimum will be the same as uh, if you just uh, solve the static uh, optimal transport problem. So this is, um, uh, this is like a very crucial observation, which is um, to say a fundamental of dynamical option, a transport. And this dynamic optimal transport has certain advantages. For instance, um, so if you just do a substitution, you say, okay, well, the M's momentum field is uh, mass times velocity, then uh, this energy becomes convex and the continuity equation becomes linear. So you're solving like convex minimization problem um, subject to linear constraints. And uh, so and actually, this is a little bit of lower dimension than if you do, let's say, the usual convex relaxation. And, the, and of course, I mean, once you can solve this problem, so then you also know the velocity field, and, and then you can also just um, find the optimal transport map. All right, so um, if one thinks about um, inverse problems, uh, and applications MRI, there's uh, one thing that is very interesting and also, um, let's say, yeah, necessary to do um, because um, you actually do not have mass preservation, right? So you don't have probability measures, you have maybe measures of positive mass. Okay, so, and uh, so how can you uh, incorporate this into an optimal transport framework? So uh, fortunately, there is like the concept of unbalanced optimal transport that we can use here. So and, uh, in addition to um, like the velocity field, you also have a growth rate. And um, so then uh, you, you model yeah, the, let's say the curve evolution, like the probability and you know, the measure evolution as follows. So the continuity equation is not homogeneous as the right hand side. And you see that the growth rate is just uh, corresponding, let's say, to the sources and things that you can have. And of course, final initial data is still the same. And then unbalanced optimal transport in a dynamic formulation is just uh, corresponding to solving uh, like this problem. So you see this is, um, solves the continuity equation or inhomogeneous here, and then you have this, there's a penalty of the velocity field, but now a weight factor, which could be also be infinity. Uh, and now you have the squared, um, the square of the, of the growth rate here. So and, um, so this is something that has been studied, yeah, well, um, quite recently, and um, uh, there are lots of very nice and beautiful results available for that. Okay, so uh, we want to use this unbalanced optimal transport energy for as a regularizer, and of course we have to, let's say, go through a little bit of the functional analytic framework that we are um, yeah, that we are have to set up. Uh, so, okay, well, so what we have to do is we have to uh, consider, of course, a space time cylinder and then, yeah, measures on this space time cylinder could be anything. And um, so, uh, so we are considering triplets here and we are just setting up this energy here. So, like this, um, and this is as follows. So, you, you just choose one measure, which is positive and dominating all. Uh, yeah, measure of the triple, and then you just plug in this function psi here. Um, you you plug in the rather nicotine derivatives and uh, integrate it with respect to the dominating measure. So in here, uh, the psi is just like this x squared is corresponding to the velocity squared, and the y squared is corresponding to the growth rate squared, and the t is corresponding like to the mass here. So this is uh, how you evaluate this. Of course, um, yeah, you have to. Uh, rule out negative solutions here, um, but this is giving you the end grain. This is just a straightforward generalization of the energy that you would uh, 
um, expect, right? So this is like from the Binamu Bernier part here, and this is like from the additional penalty on the growth rate here. And what you now have defined is something that is not like an integral, but it's just um, generalization to arbitrary random measure, which you actually need if you want to minimize over the random space. Okay, so you get the proper convex v scar lower semi continuous and one homogeneous functional. Um, you also have some nice properties here. So, for instance, if the energy is finite and you solve the continuity equation, um, so then you know that um, you, this, you have this disintegration property. So, the curve is actually disintegrated into something um, corresponding to the Lebesgue measure in time and like a curve of positive. Um, uh, Radon measures here, so so you actually get something that is involving in time and not just concentrating uh, in certain time points. Um, you also get a, like a velocity field, um, yeah, because by actual continuity, and you also get some growth rate, and then the energy is actually what you would expect. Okay, so everything is fine, and you can use it as an energy for Tikhonov regularization. Okay, so now what about the dynamic inverse problems that we are solving? Okay, we have to find a model for that. And uh, it's, um, we are using the following. So again, we have, let's say, uh, like a bounded open domain. And, uh, and then uh, we are considering like the unit interval. And for each time here, we have a forward operator, KT star, mapping like radon measures into the data space. And the data space is Hilbert space. And now both can depend on time. And, um, the inverse problem in a dynamic setting is then, okay, so you have some data, uh, so which is depending on time, where for each time you have uh, you're in the right Hilbert space, and then you wish to find a curve, um, yeah, for, for rather measures such that if you apply the time dependent forward operator, you just need the data. Okay, so like, this is how, how you can formulate dynamic inverse problems. And now you can do Tikhonov regularization um, for, yeah, for this, uh, Problem, which is of course generally ill posed. And um, so the generation of what we saw in a static case would be like, yeah, the quadratic discrepancy now integrated with respect to time. And then, yeah, we are using an optimal transport um, regularizer and also like an additional total variation term, which is just a rather norm to make it more coercive and sub level sets compact. And of course, we don't have to forget about the continuity equation. Okay, and this already ensures that if you have finite energy, so that you have, let's say, this kind of disintegration, so you actually have a curve, uh, and of course, the motion, and also like a contrast change field. Okay, so that just um, this would give you a short overview um, on, like, say, the functional energetic background that one one needs now here for the this dynamic inverse problem setup. Um, so the, the one problem is that this data spaces so they vary in uh, so so they vary in time and of course if you were to do integration so they have to be measurable in some sense and we just developed the following model for this so we say okay well um, so we have a common banner space here and, and some kind of embedding that embed into the time dependent Hilbert spaces uh, so the embeddings are dense and also uniformly bounded and then we need like a minimal um, measurability um assumption namely that if you take like a pair from the better space the common space and you just take the scalar product um in, of the embeddings in the Hilbert space which now varies with time so these have to be measurable so this is very easily verifiable assumption but of course you have to do it because otherwise you cannot integrate and then you can just run the whole machine here let's say um of Bochner space basically this is a generalization of Bochner spaces in some sense. So you can say what a step function is. Um, uh, so the step function have values in D, it's a better space. And then you can say what strongly measurable means. And this is just the usual criterion adapted to the setting. So um, strongly measurable means like almost everywhere limit um, of step function. And here you have to also take into account that uh, like almost everywhere limit means um, the, the norms depending on time. Okay, but if you have such concepts, uh, so then you can just define an L2 space um, with time varying data. So what you do is you map into like the union of these uh, Hilbert spaces, uh, take care that for each T you are on the right one, that you're strongly measurable. And of course, it's the norm that you would expect is finite. And this is actually the Hilbert space. Um, so we have the usual scalar product and you can do, uh, let's say, yeah, well, so, uh, you can just use the, the, these kind of measures they're set up to solve your problem. 
And of course, you could also try to integrate this function here. So um, like the name L2 just uh, suggest this. However, um, so what you would um, need to consider is that the integral is something in dual space and it only exists in general in, in, as a weak star integral. So you can just test against something in D, the pre dual space, and, and you just um, integrate it like that. And um, so this will be your in integral. And this is not often not strongly measurable if like the, the star, for instance, is not separable, so not necessarily. So it's like a, a very kind of integral. So this is a price we have to pay because we, we are integrating over spaces uh, which not, do not necessarily um, fit together. Okay, let's um, also discuss a little bit about yeah, um, like the assumptions that we need on the operators. Uh, again, like you want to we have time depending operators here, so they just have to map the Radon space to the time dependent data space. This should be done in linear continuous and also in a weak star to weak continuous way. So basically, these are adjoint mappings. So they should be, let's say, uniformly bound. And then also minimal measurability assumption, meaning that if you fix uh, like the element in Radon space and you just let only the operator run to the fixed element, so this should be strongly measurable in the data space here too. Okay, and then you, you know that. Um, if you have, let's say, such a curve, which is weak star continuous or narrow continuous, so then uh, like the outcome is actually mapping into L2H, and you can just well define these Tihunov functionals. So you have some data here. So, um, so you have, let's say, the, the elements in the space that we will minimize over. So you're integrating then the credit discrepancy, and you add these. Um, yeah, like the energies here, also the constraints, and, and this is uh, then well defined. And it has all the necessary properties to show that you have a solution by the direct method. So this is uh, all fitting together. And of course, under some circumstances, you can also show uniqueness. And uh, moreover, you also have stability, which is something like an issue for, let's say, um, of course, inverse problems. So noisy data have to convert strongly, for instance. So you have, let's say, a true solution, um, which also has finite energy. And then if you choose the parameters right, so you get subsequent to weak star convergence. So like the analogon that we also have in this set of case. Okay, and uh, you can apply this actually to undersampled MRI, which is uh, magnetic resonance imaging with, with a few measurements, not enough that you need. And this is, as you can see, this is also, let's say, like a generalization of uh, the dynamic super resolution in, in some sense. So just let's fix the domain. I mean, you can also take other one. So then, then um, in MRI, it's like the function that you wish to recover corresponds to the proton density. And then what you do is, um, so you have these data spaces and the data space I2 spaces uh, sub, uh, in relation to time varying sampling measures. And these sampling measures can really act really vary with time. So they could, for instance, be time depending um, line measures that rotate in time. So this is corresponding to radial undersampling. But you also can think about them as, let's say, point measures, um, so which move um, yeah, along some trajectory in time. So you're just uh, you're only measuring a few points from the Fourier. Um, uh, from the Fourier transform, and this is how you sample that. And then, of course, a forward operator is just like that you that you just look at the Fourier transform here in the space, um, and this the space has, uh, let's say, large null sets, for instance, here, everything outside of the peaks, and this is how you model, let's say, finite um, uh, many points as data management uh, measurements or um, also like line measurements, just uh, forgetting about like, all the information from the Fourier space um, by um, uh, looking at the um, corresponding equivalence classes. And of course, there's some subtleties in MRI that are maybe not uh, um, uh, the might be there in uh, super resolution, so you can you also have let's say core sensitivities which are continuous functions that you have to multiply. So you have multiple coils, so you just get also a tuple here. So that's a little bit more than uh, flexibility here. Um, this is just to show you that if you do it like this, and you also have let's say these measures, the sampling measures here are bounded, uh, uniform bounded, and you have let's say the the measurability condition that you would expect here. So then you can apply this straightforward, and you can solve. Uh, in 2D here, uh, now like this undersampled MRI problem uh, and with uh, optimal transport, regulation, dynamic, and also balanced case. 
Okay, so now there's a special case um, that you can see that this is a binomial Brignier energy, so which is uh, the balance case. So this corresponds to the, like, the weight delta being infinity. And in that case, uh, things are a little bit easier, right? Because the binomial Brignier energy is um, just only, uh, it's a little bit simpler. So you can just forget about the new part here. Uh, so it's just like the squared, um, yeah, obviously a norm over to T, like what you would expect. So, so, so no Y here, no U here. So um, uh, the spaces where you optimize are a little bit smaller. And also like the regularizer is a little bit easier. So like, again, no mu here, so you just have this kind of energy, which is kind of well defined, plus like the total variation part. And of course, the continuity equation has, is homogeneous, eh? zero on the right hand side. Okay, now what what you can do um, for the this kind of energy? So you can now um, consider like the the balls of this energy, right? So where the, the energy is bounded by one, and look at the extremal points of this. Eh? So the, um, so so we, we can try to do this. So extremal points exist, and it's just in, in a weak star sense, just um, if you close them, it gives you the whole hull. And um, actually, yeah, well, these extremal points. Um, are computable. So, uh, in order to describe what um, what these are, we, we are looking at absolutely continuous curves of order two within the domain. So these are basically curves with Sobolev regularity. And for each of the curve, we define, let's say, like a measure and also like momentum. So the measure here is uh, like the delta um, with respect to the curve at t. And they back in time, so like it's a moving point, right? It's a moving trajectory here, up to a constant. So the momentum is just this trajectory times the derivative of this curve. So it, it's pointing in the tangential direction here, and this factor here is just the energy uh, um, in terms of binomial Brignier uh, that that you get if you do not have this one here. So this is just a no this is norming to one, the energy. Uh, uh, in terms of binomial Brigny. Okay, and then uh, you know that the extremal points are exactly all, yeah, well, all, all these um, trajectories of AC2 curves and zero because, uh, well, this ball is actually, yeah, the cone and like a cut, cut off cone. Okay, and this is, um, this is very nice. So we proved that. And um, so why is this relevant? Because, um, if you look at like a finite dimensional version of the problem, you, you get inherently you get sparsity. So a finite dimensional problem could look like this, for instance. So instead of like continuous time measurements, you have only finitely many times measurements. So then uh, the data space, of course, it can still vary with time, but then it's just like a usual uh, Cartesian project. And also, of course, the forward measurements are only finitely many, and they just are linear star continuous. And then the inverse problems is just solving the equation for this finitely many times. The Tihonov function also accounts for that, and it's just no longer an integral here, but it's just a sum. And of course, uh, the regularizer is the binomial Brunier regularizer. Another point is that if you just look at these finite dimensional data problems, so then you can show that you always have solutions of the form um, that are composed of conical or conic combinations of extremal points. And the extremal points are known. Um, in, in this example, so you can say that they are uh, co composed of finitely many uh, trajectories here. Huh? So, uh, and this is how it corresponds to sparsity. And so, this trajectory in each time you have a sparse solution, and of course, they're evolving there. And this is, um, I think, um, uh, giving us also like um, um, like opportunity to um, look at a respective algorithm here. So, and I will show you one in a minute. Okay, so what is behind this uh, theorem about sparse solution? Uh, so it's it's uh, like a replication of a representer theorem that recently came up. Um, so and um, like this result also, if you look at extreme points, holds in a much more general sense. Okay, just for the direction. So um, we did this first for the binomial Brignier energy, but um, also for the Hellinger Kantorovich regularizer, which is corresponding to the up balanced optimal transport. So we just dis uh, discussed before this can be done. And um, so the extremal points are a little bit more complicated because uh, so because of um, 
uh, yeah, non-constant mass. So you, you have trajectories where um, there's a positive weight in front of it, so the mass can change in time. Um, the momentum is the same, but also the right hand side is, is like solving this kind of um, property here. So, and of course, um, well, there's a little bit more behind this. So the, this weight function here is, uh, is regular in a certain sense. Um, also, the gamma is regular in a certain sense. Um, but in the end, we have this external point characterization. And this based on a superposition principle, of course, for this inhomogeneous equation, we have the right kind of data. Okay, so um, let's now look at an algorithm for solving the binar moving year regularized problem because this is the easier one. Um, and we are just trying to do the same kind of conditional gradient method, so we're just trying to drive it as for the static case, but now, of course, for this Tichenor functional. And uh, yeah, what we still need to do, as before, we need to um, ensure, let's say, super linear growth um, from a certain threshold on. Here we're just cutting off with infinity. That's the right threshold. It sort of changes the solution. And, and then the conditional gradient method, yeah, well, it does what it does. So it just linearizes like these quadratic terms and then uh, solves the linear problem plus uh, this uh, modified regularizer. And this is how it looks like, right? You can compute the derivative. And uh, so this is a linear term, right? So this linearization of this one here plus that one here. And this is giving us a new direction in the conditional gradient method in each step. Um, so now, since we know, um, yeah, well, so which we know the, the Binomo-Brenier ball and extremal points. Uh, so this um, allows us to reformulate the problem. So we're looking at the same dual variable, it's the same linear problem, but now um, we are just uh, restricting um, these, like the candidates um, to like this ball here. And then we know that there is a solution that is an extremal point. And so we only have to look for, on, on the set of extremal points uh, for this linearized problem here. And once we have found this, so there's like, you can compute a constant um, so if you rescale the solution, so we get uh, the solution of the original, let's say, sub problem of the conditional gradient method. Okay, and this is uh, then yeah, already giving us the method, right? So we start, let's say, with zero, and um, then we are just uh, having, let's say, a number of um, like a finite number of um, external points here, so which are corresponding to these trajectories. Um, and of course, the weights can always be positive. Then we compute like the dual variable, and then we're solving among all the external points, uh, uh, like yeah, the minimization problem here, and this can be rephrased as this. Um, once we found a solution, we just add it as a candidate, like the trajectory here as a candidate um, to the already existing ones, and then um, different from what we did for the static case, uh, we are just um, minimizing like the whole Tichenor functional uh, with respect to the coefficients of these fixed trajectories here. And this is a quadratic program. So, and it's a finite dimension. So this can be solved with uh, quadratic programming techniques. And of course, uh, so yeah, well, so the coefficients here, the zero are just thrown away and the rest are just uh, taken as they are and they give the next iterate. So this is how, so we just have a conditional gradient method for uh, finding these trajectories. And as, yeah, well, it's, it's a conditional gradient method. So we also have, let's say, the same kind of convergence. So um, so the, the sequence is minimizing. You have the one over n um, the, uh, rate. And of course, uh, weak star accumulation points are minimizers. So the same thing as before, but also because we now do the quadratic, quadratic programming step um, for the coefficients, uh, we have in some cases faster convergence. This is related to, let's say, this accelerated variance of the conditional gradient Frank Wolf method, where um, yeah, where you basically can also show this for delta peak solutions and Radon norm regularization, um, and it extends here. However, one needs a really strong regularity assumption when it's, let's say, um, assumptions on the dual variable, but then you have this R linear convergence also in terms of the, of course, the function distance and the curves and also the coefficients. So we have a proof for that. Okay, so um, now, of course, um, like the steps in the conditional gradient method, in particular, the linear 
step, so which is like the curve insertion problem, is a little bit more complicated. So if you look at this more closely, you can see that. Um, uh, so this is non-convex. So we need to, yeah, well, we need to do something here. Uh, one thing that one can do is under additional assumption that we can use gradient descent. And if you do gradient descent, so then you also have strong convergence here. So numerically, it's quite stable. Um, but um, this, you might also run into stationary points, of course, of the non-convexity. So you have to, let's say, employ some strategies uh, to, to always get to the, say the global minimizer, which can be obtained in surprisingly many cases, just in numerically. So you can use multiple starts, for instance, you can just look at crossovers, also just uh, add a little bit of randomness on, uh, to just uh, to make these things more robust. Um, there's also an alternative, so you can also try to um, solve this curve insertion problem via dynamic programming. So this is in the work that just appeared after we um, published, let's say, this um, um, algorithm with gate and descent. Um, you can also do what is called sliding step. I mean, we, we also implemented that, which means that uh, you just fix, let's say, a point, and then you minimize um, not only with respect to the coefficient, but also with respect to the curves. Uh, so the, the curves can vary, and uh, you can just also do gradient descent, for instance, there. Um, what else is uh, also um, available? So you can, um, yeah, well, you can just employ a stopping criterion uh, for the solution, which is quite convenient. So, um, so if you have, uh, let's say, a solution of the linearized problem that satisfies this property and this is computable, so you can stop, or if you, so it's less or equal than one, if you add a little bit of tolerance, you just uh, can also stop up to the tolerance. Okay, so in, in, in the end, we have something implementable and uh, one can show, one can do computation, one can show numerical experiments regarding this. And um, uh, so here, um, yeah, well, this is like a, let's say, a rudimentary, yeah, um, super resolution problem. So if you think about super resolution as uh, recovery from finitely many Fourier transform coefficients. Um, so we are in a static case. We are measuring, like in 2D, only these 20 points on the spiral, which is corresponding to some MI techniques. And we just try to yeah, see what, what comes out for typical examples. So here's, for instance, a simple example that we just, uh, with three curves, uh, moving in time. And on the right-hand side, you can see the back projected data. So just, um, you know, um, using the adjoint of the forward operator, uh, applying this. Um, uh, and it gives you, let's say, a little bit about the overview of the quality of the data. So you see that it's a very, very low resolution. So, all right. So this is um, what we obtain if we run the algorithm. So you can see um, that um, uh, so that the reconstruction is quite good. So visually, there is not much of a difference. Um, however, we have some additional curves. Maybe I just run this again. Okay, yeah, let's try. No, it's it's a little bit stuck the animation, um, but you saw this. Uh, so the anim so the curves that we just shown in the last example were actually not all. So we have some curves with very very low um, uh, weights here, which are also shown here. So sorry that the animation is stuck at some point, um, but we can easily threshold them away, and then we actually get very good results. And here you can see like the threshold away curves of the match. So you have a little bit of a bias because of the regularization um, here, but um, the match is quite nice. You also have, let's say, a good uh, convergence property of the algorithm because it just uses all these tricks that I just introduced. And um, uh, we can also try to solve more complicated problems with that. Again, here, like uh, three curves um, where two are touching at one point. Sorry that the animation stuck again at this point. Um, but we try to recover this, and I hope that, oh no, okay, so uh, I hope that you can see them. Basically, it's, um, um, well, yeah, okay, so uh, it's recovering quite well. Here's a plot where you can see, let's say, the reconstruction together with the ground truth, and you can see that also like this more complicated problem is solved quite well. And why is this problem more complicated? Because at this point, uh, the two curves is touch, and if you just uh, look at static formulation, so uh, a static recovery algorithm would not be able to um, to separate the, the, these two data points here, these two data peaks. Again, convergence is also working quite nicely. 
Last example I wish like to show is like the crossing example that you can see here. So you have two curve crossing. And um, here is something, yeah, well, interesting, maybe not too surprising is happening. So the reconstruction that you get is not crossing, but there are two curves that just like do not touch, but bump away from each other and, and then follow the path here. And the reason for that is that the benamo grenier energy is lower for this uh, bumpy solution, let's say, um, than like the crossing curve and therefore it's, um, of course, formed by the minimization problem, by the minimization process. Okay, and here you can see, right? So the, like the ground truth curve, and then like he has a little bit of bump, and maybe higher order approaches would help here. Again, we have nice convergence of the algorithm. Okay, so I'm at the end of my talk, so I would like to conclude. So um, what I try to show is that, uh, that we can have a rigorous framework for optimal transport regulation for time dependent inverse problems, which cover several applications, I think. Um, so we characterize the extreme points of the binamo grenier regularizer. Um, uh, so which gives us these trajectories that we wish to, um, we wish to see. We have a numerical algorithm for dynamic spike reconstruction. You know, it really is adapted to finding, let's say, these moving trajectories here. And you can also apply it as we have seen already. And what we also can do is just think about a lot of further directions. For instance, like this accelerated convergence um, is something that we were working on. I just showed you that we have a proof, but the proof is maybe is at the moment not published. And of course, the extension of the unbalanced optimal transport. Uh, so this is something where we have the characterization to extreme point can also further um, be made and uh, we have a, a whole let's say a bunch of perspective okay uh, i would like to point out this literature here so i would like to um thanks uh, the, like our funders for the support um, for this research and um i think this is yeah well so this is where i would like to stop and i thank you for your attention thank you very much very nice talk. Uh, are there questions from the audience? You can either just speak up or you can also write it in the chat. Uh, maybe I can start with one. <clears throat> so can is, is there some simple intuition of what you need to assume more to get a faster convergence rate? Uh, um. It's, it's not simple at all because um, so the, the problem is that you on the one hand have let's say this binamo grenier energy which is just you can do it for each rather method but you also have the um, continuity equation as a constraint so if you look at say what you can call dual certificates um, so the, so these have to decompose somehow right so you have um, you have a part this is a gradient and uh, you have a part that is corresponding to, yeah, well, to this, um, the subdifferential of the binomial Bonnier energy. And of course, you wish to have, in the end, like on the trajectories that um, the, 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 on this trajectories, like the one component is active. And then if you move away, so let's say some kind of quadratic growth. And um, uh, so this, this would be, let's say, the intuition. However, like this decomposition into like the gradient field uh, and this like a subdifferential part of the binamo energy. So this is something where we only really don't have a good intuition. So we actually cannot um, say when, let's say we can, um, if, yeah, well, we, we cannot say when we can just decompose like that and because these things are very non-local and from continuous functions, um, it, it's not so easy. So this, this is the best that I can tell you at the moment, right? So we, we think that if you, let's say, can control the one part and you have like this quadratic growth, and of course you have to also take care that the trajectories do not cross. So this is one example there, then everything is fine. And if you just neglect this and uh, do not care about like the gradient part, then, then basically that is, that is um, um, what you would need. Thank you. And one more question. In your numerical experiments, you had like three curves. Uh, 
what can you say uh, about what happens when you increase the number of uh, ground truth curves? Uh, what is happening numerically? And I mean, will, is it harder to reconstruct? Um, yeah. 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 So what, what we what we observed is that it breaks down at some point. Okay. So the which is um, uh, which is I mean so the, which is also the same in the static case. Uh, so if you have too many data peaks. Uh, and you just only have the, let's say, a limited number of measurements, so, that, so you cannot reconstruct everything. And this is what you also observed in dynamic um, setting, um, but numerically, this looks a little bit more wild. Okay, so that, so because, um, so yeah, it's a little bit unfortunate that the, the animation were not so smooth, um, but I mean, already in the approach, maybe, so one last try. Um, let's yeah but you see already like these uh, additional curves here that pop up right so you see how wild they are and just imagine this um, with something that is completely um yeah so com with looking random somehow but you can i mean you can you can recognize this it's not not really nice so, so um, yeah i mean it's, experience it's, it's, com yeah. it's completely reasonable that it breaks down at some point because you're regularizing for these types of curves, so yeah. Uh, somehow, yeah, yeah. Of, co of course, we wish to have something like you know, like this recovery results, right? So you can say maybe like you know, like number of points, separation distance, whatever. Um, but we found this to be very, very complicated. So it seems to be very challenging to get this. Yes. Uh, are there questions from the audience? Yes, so we have a question in the chat. Uh, in the final example, you mentioned these higher order regularizations uh, to, with, with, with the example with the crossing curves. So why do you think that could be helped by, by a higher order regularizations? Yeah, because if you look at these lines, so if you look at the velocity field, so then the second derivative is zero. So, and if you just, I mean, if you only see the second derivative, um, so then, um, uh, so then this will be of lower energy. So it's just like a very, very rough intuition of, um, so how, how could you make, let's say these crossing lines cheaper in energy than, um, uh, then what the Binamo ener energy is currently doing, and the Binamo energy for these curves is just um, basically the L2 norm of the derivative. And if you just do it like the two norm for the second um, derivative, um, then this, this will somehow vanish. So um, this will hopefully be preserved, right? So preferred in the solution. Okay, I, I hope that uh, answers the questions. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, then, yeah, I think we are done for today. Thank you very much again, Christian, for this talk. Thank you again. It was, very, it was a big pleasure to, uh, to be here. Yes.